Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you for joining Mokana on our webinar today. Today I will be covering IoT security and in particular reviewing the differences between threat detection and device protection, detection versus protection. My name is Kao Kandek and I'm the Vice President of Marketing at Mokana. Well, there's no question, IoT is taking the world by storm. It's connecting our world within our homes, in our cities, and, uh, and even on our cars. C connected cars are, uh, are prolific. Uh, really, most cars on the road today are all drive-by-wire, meaning that when you turn the steering wheel or press the brake, it actually sends sensor data to uh, a control unit, an elect engine, engine control unit, that then takes action um, and causes the car to do something. And they're all connected, increasingly connected via infotainment. Uh, on the industrial side, industrial application performance management is also having a big impact on the, uh, the maintenance and uptime of industrial systems. And we're moving rapidly into uh, new areas like autonomous driving tractors. Uh, the challenge is that in spite of the growth of IoT, security is still a problem. And with all of the great features that you can gain and benefits, business benefits you can gain from IoT, security is rarely the top feature. And what's going on here? You know, should it be a top feature? Um, well, if you are uh, pay attention to the news at all, it seems like every several weeks or every month there's a new cyber attack. And not just a cyber attack on, uh, on surveillance cameras like the Mirai virus, but also attacks on industrial control systems, on, on things that actually can cause loss of life or threat to reliability or safety. So what's going on here? Well, there are a number of things. There are always vulnerabilities in systems. So whether it's your computer, your laptop, uh, or a small industrial control device, or even an embedded system, a uh, micro control unit, uh, they all have potential vulnerabilities. And when systems need to be patched, uh, where the, the firmware or software needs to be patched, it may take up to uh, 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 120 days for companies, once they receive a release, to actually patch their systems. And during that time, those systems are vulnerable. There are also other things that make systems and IoT systems vulnerable. One is an over-reliance on passwords, and uh, really, oftentimes, that means that there's no machine-to-machine -machine authentication and, uh, and no multi-factor authentication. Still, in the IoT world, because these devices are, uh, can be in a, a, a factory environment or out in the field or in a place that the device can be physically tampered with, they're also vulnerable to physical compromise. So take a car for example. A car has can have up to a hundred ECUs uh, in them and those ECUs can control everything from safety and driver assistance to the powertrain, navigation, infotainment, uh, autonomous driving, uh, cameras, and communications. There are many vulnerabilities in a system like this, including being able to access the maintenance port in cars to get on a CAN bus network, or to hack in through Bluetooth to reach an infotainment uh, um, uh, uh, software in the car that would then that may have a vulnerability that can be used to hack into other devices, and. With cars in particular, they rely on older networking technology. And once you're in the network, you can begin to send commands to various uh, ECUs and begin to take control of the car, as we've seen on, in several attacks on, uh, uh, on Jeeps, 
uh, and even uh, a Tesla. Medical devices. We've seen many of these medical devices become um, uh, 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 inoperable um, with things like ransomware that impact uh, medical imaging devices or uh, devices in the OR. And oftentimes that takes place with an initial breach on a computer system that then propagates and releases malware uh, into other medical devices. So there are a lot of vulnerabilities, smart homes, connected devices, etc. And I think some of the, the more interesting areas are also in the industrial sector. So uh, power plants, everything from the uh, distributed control systems that make up all of the temperature sensors, pressure gauges, air flows, uh, master controllers that are all duplicated and roll up to gateways that are then controlled by HMIs and workstations. All of these systems have embedded uh, uh, microprocessors in them, and they're dependent on, on the security, the hardware-based security and the software-based security on that system. If an attacker gets into the network, they can begin to compromise those, uh, uh, those devices. So when you think about a, a device that you need to protect. In the industrial space, um, uh, we use something called the Purdue Reference Model. And it basically looks at the different levels of, um, uh, of devices and control and processes uh, within an overall industrial control system. So at the very bottom, there are level zero and level one devices. So these would be the sensors, uh, controllers, uh, programmable logic controllers, PLCs, and those are typically air-gapped with a firewall to other controllers that control and can uh, manipulate multiple controllers. Uh, and that may be within a certain area, maybe a single factory or a substation in, a power, in an electric grid. That also is firewalled and air-gapped to a more uh, global or uh, major region operation and control center. And all of that data is then air-gapped up to uh, level four and five that can take a lot of that information, that SCADA, uh, supervisory control and data acquisition um, uh, information and protocols and bring that up ultimately into the enterprise. So it's a complex system, and you have to have the policies and procedures, the platform, and the network to control it and secure it. Now, there are on the network side various methods that we use, uh, air gapping or firewalling, um, but we use a number of, of uh, other technologies, access controls, firewalls, protocol filtering, and threat detection. Many of these, for example, firewalls or protocol filtering and threat detection, anomaly detection, really reside within the network and not typically within those level zero and level one devices, meaning that you can have all of the network protection within a, an environment, an IoT environment or industrial control environment, and if a hacker gets inside the network, uh, as we saw with things like Stuxnet, jumping three air gaps, um, those control system processes and the machines that rely on them can all be compromised. And uh, that creates a serious vulnerability. And this is where in IoT, uh, it becomes uh, more important to think about security and protecting those devices because the consequences are not simply loss of data uh, or, or a compromise of data privacy. You actually open yourself up to hackers being able to take control of a power grid, uh, uh, turning off power, uh, breaking into a compressor in a oil and gas refinery, or being able to uh, take control of a car, for example. So very serious consequences. And the reality is, is that 
that the cyber attacks that we see on IoT systems are happening principally because the network detection mechanisms and uh, uh, network detection uh, uh, solutions aren't really working. Uh, for example, if an, uh, a hacker takes over a compromised device, maybe it's a Windows machine leveraging a, a new Windows vulnerability that hasn't been patched, that user has control of that system and they're inside the network. They can now bypass IDS, access controls, whitelisting, VPNs, and launch attacks directly on level one devices. Same thing on, as, a, as a physical attack. Uh, it's absolutely uh, realistic to think that hackers would uh, physically bypass firewalls and physical enclosures, uh, perhaps dressed as a, uh, a maintenance person, a sysadmin without uh, um, the right credentials, but physically bypassing it to attack those systems. And then finally, there are situations where uh, network detection breaks down, uh, such as protocol filtering and unidirectional gateways, whereby an authorized user either makes a mistake or issues an unauthorized command. That could be a rogue employee or someone just making a mistake. But any of those vectors of attack and actors can actually take advantage of the vulnerabilities on a device by using a number of those methods that detection mechanisms don't, don't really prevent. Now, what do they do once they get access to a targeted IoT device? Well, typically that device may have uh, ports on it. And if many of those ports are left open uh, or are published, the attacker can uh, get into the device via port and then further leverage a known vulnerability, either in the BIOS and boot process, in the kernel, the operating system, or the application. And typical vulnerabilities may, thing, may be things like taking advantage of buffer overflows or uh, which is you know being able to um, call information from registers that may include information that should have been deleted, uh, like passwords, or it may be being able to log in and and see protocols and how they're being used to control the device. Uh, but in any case, an attacker will bypass uh, a defense, use a particular vector of attack and use that to uh, um, leverage a specific vulnerability that they have found in a particular target device. And once they're in there, they can reload firmware, take over the device, send bogus information, uh, or even spoof data from that device to a, uh, an HMI or, a, uh, uh, or an application performance system, um, uh, an analytics platform, and uh, spoof bad data from that device. So it's critical that we begin to think of protecting these systems and using protective mechanisms that extend down below the typical supervisory and control computers uh, all the way down into the IoT devices and uh, both level zero and level one devices. And that is for everything from device identity, multi-factor authentication, protecting the update process, encrypting and securing the communications, and, and really moving beyond just detection into protecting those devices. And that's where if you truly are protecting those systems, uh, rather than relying on detecting uh, potential hacks, you can significantly improve uh, the reliability and, and, and level of safety of your devices and systems. Uh, you can do that through a number of uh, mechanisms. So, for example, on the device itself, using hardware and software to verify the boot process by making sure that every time that device powers on, that the, uh, uh, the BIOS is loaded that is uh, 
that should be loaded. The OS and the kernel and the applications are loaded, um, and they're all trusted. Um, so you know it is it is what is supposed to be on that device. You can use multi-factor authentication and digital certificates to ensure that that device uh, uh, maintains uses a, a normal public private key uh, system uh, and X509 digital certs to actually allow that device to authenticate in to a network um, based on uh, on digital certificates rather than and uh, cryptography rather than just passwords. And, uh, and you can use a variety of, of stronger mechanisms to update software and firmware. And within the security space in the embedded world, there are various levels of encryption and encryption strength uh, that you can use, as well as uh, various forms of hardware-based routes of trust where you can hide private keys in silicon, such as with technologies like uh, TPM. So all of those, when implemented either in software or hardware in these IoT devices, can significantly improve the security uh, on a device so that even if a, a, an actor, actor uh, gets into the network, they won't be able to authenticate into um, that device and break through multiple factors of authentication, multiple di digital certificates and they won't be able to load malware on that device or change any of the, uh, of the applications, principally because deeply embedded within um, uh, the chips are protective cryptographic mechanisms. And this is how we can begin to really make a, a, a big impact on uh, the, the reliability and safety and, and security of IoT systems and industrial control systems. Um, uh, for example, uh, we at Makana have worked with uh, Xilinx, Avnet, Infineon, uh, Microsoft on developing a, 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 a board that includes hardware from Xilinx and MPSOC from Xilinx, uh, the board manufactured by Avnet, and Infineon TPM PMOD, um, and, uh, and Makana's software handling all of the cryptographic functions, so coordinating between the crypto accelerator, uh, the chipset, and MPSOC, and, and uh, the specific CPU, as well as the TPM, and allowing the, um, the applications on, on this board to actually call cryptographic functions that, are, that improve the security of the device. Additionally, with Microsoft, they uh, also put in their uh, IoT Hub, Azure IoT Hub SDK to allow that device to securely authenticate and connect into uh, the Azure IoT Cloud. So the importance of this is, uh, is that it's an effort to make it easier for developers to develop and use strong security in endpoint devices. And um, while IoT, again, is cool and features are cool, uh, we find that one of the biggest challenges is device designers and software developers think about security uh, really after the application has been architected and designed. And if you can think about security from the beginning of the process, if you're an OEM or, a, uh, or a, uh, an IoT product company, if you think about security from the beginning, and architect security into your product, uh, it will be, um, uh, well, you'll do, you'll do us all a great favor in improving the, the security of, your, uh, of, uh, of, of the IoT. So uh, with that, uh, you know, a bit about Mokana. We are an uh, uh, embedded security software company. We have about 200 customers. They're mostly large. Uh, global OEMs, uh, companies like Bosch and Siemens and GE and, um, uh, and Schneider Electric, uh, Yokogawa. Uh, these companies use Mokana, Mokana software uh, to build into their products to improve the security 
um, and cybersecurity profile of their products, make them harder to uh, hack into and to defend against some of the cyber attack vectors that I went over. We've been around since 2002. Uh, our software is running on more than 100 million devices, and uh, we have not had a, a, a vulnerability, knock on wood, um, since our founding in 2002. And uh, we love to work with uh, manufacturers, uh, OEMs, ODMs, contract manufacturers, IoT companies, as well as infrastructure operators that are trying to build applications that are mission critical. And, uh, and Mokana software really protects the devices as well as the device to cloud and device to SCADA network communications. Um, so uh, with that, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, wrap this webinar up. And uh, if you do have a question, please do reach out to Mokana. And I want to thank you for your time today. And uh, please join us again as we cover additional aspects of IoT security from uh, the risks and advantages of using uh, uh, open source versus non-open source software, um, and also risks to specific sectors, whether it's automotive or industrial or aerospace or medical and healthcare. So thank you again for your time, and have a wonderful day.